one. So they're expressing different genes. Now, as scientists, we can tell what genes are being turned on or off by using a technique that involves something commonly called a DNA chip. This is a small microscope slide onto which has been spotted all of the genes, a copy of all of the genes in the human genome, which is about 30,000 genes. And so I'll show you with an example using a nerve cell here how we would go about doing that. So if we wanted to know which genes were expressed in this nerve, so here we have the head of the nerve where the nucleus is found, and here's the axon, and then here's the business end that sends the signal. If we wanted to know what was going on in terms of which genes were on and off in this, we would extract the nucleic acid, which I'm going to do here with this turkey baster since we've just finished Thanksgiving. So you'd suck out the nucleic acid, extract it from the cell, and then using the part of the nucleic acid called RNA, which represents the genes which have been expressed or turned on, one can make a probe from that and label the probe with a fluorescent marker. That's then applied to a DNA chip, and I have my little DNA chip here, which some of you may remember from playing games as a child. We then take our labeled probe and put it into this chip like this, and this will, because there are spots representing every gene in the genome, tell us exactly which genes are on, shown here, or off in the other color. Now, I've done this with a nerve, and it would be a different result, a different pattern if we used a different cell type. And I'll show you in the next slide an example of a chip, a cartoon of one, and what it would look like. So here, in principle, then, are the 30,000 genes found on the chip, and some of them will be what are called cell type specific, like the nerve I just did, and others would be genes found in all cells, sometimes called housekeeping genes, things like histones, uh, the gene for the histone protein would be expressed because all cells need histones to wrap up their chromosomes or there would be other proteins needed for this general cellular machinery. Here's then an example to make, to make or emphasize this point that different cells express different sets of genes. And if I did my little trick right, you'll see that our connectoid there looks just like a nerve cell. Um, blood cells would have a different pattern as would a pancreatic beta cell. So the point here, then, is that we can use the expression of genes to monitor what's happening during development as cells are making decisions about their fate. Now, how do we put this all together? Well, if we want to know what happens during the life of a cell, how do you get from an unspecialized, undifferentiated embryonic cell, like an inner cell mass cell, to a pancreatic beta cell? At each step, genes are turned on and off. And we can see that here in this slide. The inner cell mast cell then has the decision to make initially, should it be part of the ectoderm in blue, mesoderm in green, or endoderm in yellow. That sort of lineage tree might remind you of like uh, your own ancestry, trying to think of where things come from. And that this, similarly, those kind of lineage studies can be done on a cell like this. The first decision it's make in this picture is to become an endoderm cell, turning on some genes. The next decision is within the endoderm not to be lung, not to be liver, but instead to be pancreas. Within the pancreas, it's making a decision to become part of the endocrine component, the component that will make hormones. And finally, it makes a decision to become a pancreatic beta cell. So here, if you like, is the sort of molecular history of what a beta cell looks like. And I'd like you to think about an analogy that this relates to how your own life might unfold. What are the decisions involved in your life to tell you to become, say, a soccer player or a lawyer or a scientist? There are all kinds of influences that impinge on those decisions. And it's not a process where when you arrive from your mother's womb, you decided right then to be a scientist. This is a stepwise process that involves your education. You're affected by your neighbors in school, by your parents, and by others. And similarly, cells have to make these decisions by influences both internal and external. And so I'm going to now move to this point of how do cells know what genes to turn on and off? What are the signals that tell a cell what to do? And in general, there are two kinds of signals, one internal and the other external. The internal signals, which happen earliest in, de in development, are, come from cytoplasmic factors. These are factors which are in the cytoplasm of the egg 
and begin by sending signals into the nucleus, usually by a transcription factor, to tell it which gene to turn on and off. And we have a little video, if I could have that next, to show you what that would look like. So here you see these factors. They're color-coded to respond, to correspond to the germ layers. And they're going in and out of the nucleus to tell that nucleus which genes it should turn on and off, for example, to initiate development. We'll now move to the other kind of signal. So as initially cells are being told which part of the germ layer, which germ layer they should pick. And then they're going to move to the issue of uh, signals by adjacent cells. Here are adjacent cells that are involved in determining cell fates. In this case, I'm showing the example from the endoderm, where adjacent cells, either other endodermal cells or cells from the mesenchyme, which is a mesodermal derivative, send a signal. And as you see here, these signals go back and forth telling the cell what it should do. And then once it makes a decision, it will send signals back to the signaling cell. That can then result in the, in the end of the cell making the decision to become a pancreatic bud cell. Well, I've talked about these signals in a general sense. What are they in particular? They are almost always a kind of gene product called a growth factor. Now, that's a little bit confusing because I'm telling you that they're not involved in telling the cells to grow. But they're called growth factors because they were initially discovered by their ability to make cells grow in a tissue culture dish. There are families of growth factor molecules, and there are 100 or 200 important such signals known in development. What this looks like in this uh, picture here is that a neighboring cell will synthesize a growth factor, here shown as a little circle or a polygon, and then it gets secreted by that cell to its neighboring cell. And when the neighboring cell receives it through a protein receptor, a transmembrane receptor on its surface, it changes the fate of the cell and tells it to become a pancreatic bud cell. I will show you in a few minutes examples of these signals telling stem cells what to do. But for now, I want to summarize at this point and say, what have we covered so far? We've covered the point that from a fertilized egg to a full adult differentiated animal involves a multi-step process, a gradual stepwise signaling to cells to tell them what their fates should be. After I take some questions, we're going to talk about how those different cell types are maintained. But for now, I want to see what questions you might have about this brief summary of early development. Yes. Um, when you were showing the pictures of the nine uh, cells with the green or red showing on or off, those nine were different for each different kind of cell. Do you basically use the nine, or is, was or those just graphic representations of those kind of cells? Yeah, that was a highly simplified version. Um, in practice, what we use is all 30,000 genes on a chip to say exactly which genes are on and off out of that 30,000. And you can imagine this requires some serious statistical and computational work because it's too big of a number. It would be easy if it were like our little toy. But given that there are so many kinds of cells in the body and they change their gene expression pattern during development, it, it's not surprising that so many genes are involved. But I, I forgot to tell you that there's a reward for asking a good question like that. And here's a Harvard t-shirt. Any other questions? Yes, up there in the back. I was wondering, um, you said that the endoderm uh, is responsible for the skin. Is it also responsible for pigmentation later on? Um, yes, yeah, so the question was about the germ layer that makes the skin and the nerve, the ectoderm. And yes, it does give rise to not just the outer layer of the skin, but also the hair, the so-called sebaceous glands, which make the oil to lubricate the skin. and and many of the pigment cells. Some of the pigment cells come from the neural crest, which is also part of the ectoderm. Now, you're pretty far back, but I'm going to see if I can get this all the way up to you. What? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Another question. Yes, here. Um, you said that a cell can choose what it's going to be by growth factors. Can it have multiple growth factors, like from Say a cell might be a blood cell or a skin cell because they're so close. Can it have multiple growth factors, and what would affect, like, how would it affect the cell? Yeah, that's a great question. The way I showed it, it implied that there would be a single growth factor to tell each cell what it should do. 
But that wouldn't really make sense because you couldn't have one factor for each stage of development. In fact, what cells do is kind of take the temperature or make multiple readings. I guess we think about it like multitasking when you're using your computer. It might be reading signals from three or four growth factors, and its next decision might also depend on its history, what it is at that time. And again here, 